Hello. <clears throat> Is there, can everybody hear me? Yep. All right. Uh, let's start this. So, uh, Beneath the Killing Sea, where did that come from? Um, I was certified in 1979, and I remember as one of the last parts of our certification class, <clears throat> we came down to Emerald Isle and met Bill Lovin. <clears throat> and Bill was premiering a film at the time about North Carolina wreck diving. It was called Beneath the Killing Sea. And essentially, he, he tracked uh, wrecks like the Papoose, the U-352, uh, you know, the Saloy, the Hutton, things like that, and spun this vignette of how from tragedy these things have turned into beautiful artificial reefs, unintentional artificial reefs, but beautiful reefs nonetheless. And so that's, that's where that comes from. And essentially, that inspired me in my North Carolina diving. It, um, I go down for the fish. I'm a fishaholic. I love the marine life. Yeah, I'd probably visit if the wrecks were there, but Truck Lagoon is not worth 14, 20 hours of plane ride to me uh, if there's no fish there. So I, uh, I do cartooning of fish as a hobby uh, as well as other things, but I'm a fish. I always want to know what's happening there. And uh, Bill did one of the first wreck diving books uh, about North Carolina wreck diving. There's a picture of it here in 1976. And um, Bill's just a great guy, and I just really wanted to acknowledge his contribution to North Carolina wreck diving from the early days. He's not in great health now, but he's been an amazing uh, public servant with the school system and uh, has just really been an evangelist for all of North Carolina. Did one of the first streaming, live streaming uh, field trips from Shackleford Banks back in the day, and uh, Bill's a good guy. and. Uh, I appreciate what he did to me to inspire me uh, going forward. Uh, but why do we dive North Carolina? We're gonna set, a little bit set the table before we get into the marine life. Uh, North Carolina, if you don't know, how many divers do we have in the room? How many diver wannabes do we have in the room? All right, if we can get a couple people out of this uh, talk who suddenly want to become divers, or at least appreciate what we have under the water of North Carolina on these wrecks, uh, I'll have done my job. But essentially, if you don't know, North Carolina has been ranked in the top dive sites of the world for both wreck diving, large animal um, encounters, things like that. People are starting to travel from all over the world to see what we have off North Carolina. And for a guy who's traveled to Cocos Island in Costa Rica, if you've known that, I've done that seven times, to be with the sharks, to have this in our backyard is something we all really need to appreciate uh, going forward. Surprising to some, we have clean water and we have clear water and we have warm water. Now, it's not always like that. North Carolina is highly variable. We have our hurricanes and storms and probably five times a day, Hatteras changes weather. But uh, there are days, many days, where I've sat at 110 feet on the bottom of the ocean kneeling and could see the shadow of my boat above me. And uh, here's some examples of that. And the water in the uh, summer, surface temperature averages 78 to 80 degrees. We have shipwrecks in history. Uh, here we have uh, uh, the conning tower, the U-352 on one side, and then the uh, stern rudder section of the Papoose slash it's Hutton, and that's an interesting story that could probably uh, take another talk, but it's officially, technically, the, the uh, Hutton, but we knew it as the Papoose for 30-some years. And then we have ships like the Monitor, of which the Monitor Marine Sanctuary was uh, established. The dives, uh, real quickly, you can read this, range from as shallow as you want to as deep as you want, and they, all skill levels, all lengths of time, and the point is, this is an amazing resource for divers, and it's now getting worldwide recognition. <clears throat> but when you combine nature and man, that's what makes North Carolina diving what it is. The Gulf Stream, we cannot underestimate the role the Gulf Stream plays of both why the wrecks are there and what marine life we have on those wrecks. Um, I'll let you read, go through that and read that, but uh, the Gulf Stream is critical to the environment, both above water and below water off the North Carolina coast. 
And what that brings is warm water, or warm water, warmer water than most people realize <coughs> off the North Carolina coast. So this is a sea surface temperature graph uh, in de on December 30th. And it could be any year, but essentially December 30th. Watch how this changes when it goes in, into the end of June. That's the kind of switch in warm wa in water heat that gets generated by the Gulf Stream and gets pushed ashore. The kinetic energy of that in itself is amazing, but come with that comes currents, and this is a little cartoon I drew up about the Hatteras current scale, and, um, and you can literally get all of those at any one time, uh, even sometimes within a certain one dive. But we've all been on the ridiculous, we've seen the ridiculous, and we've seen no current at all. <clears throat> the other part of our marine environment is natural hard bottom. These are rock ledges. Uh, I say they're a limiting factor in North Carolina because there's not much of them. If that's all we had to dive, it's unlikely we'd, we'd have this worldwide reputation about diving. Um, but what these are, the topology of it is they generally are two, three, maybe up to six feet in um, topology or vertical nature, undercuts, a lot of fish life on them, and they wander in and out, peeking their way in and out of the sand, particularly down south. I don't know as much of them around Hatteras and north of Hatteras, but down at Lookout in that area, they're a good place for bottom fishing. If you follow the headboats out, that's where they tend to go bottom fishing. <coughs> But the thing that really drives makes the difference are the shipwrecks. And as we've heard other people talk about earlier today, they're sunk by storm. They're sunk by enemy action. They're sunk by friendly fire. They're sunk by collision. And they're, in art they're artificial reefs. Here's a, a map I drew up of essentially, a, this is a two scale, all the, uh, about a couple hundred ships uh, that are sunk off North Carolina in their locations. Um, but it gives you an idea of how they're spread across the state in our three, three capes, uh, or four capes really, when you talk about the Oregon Inlet area, um, Wimble Shoals, but uh, Essentially, they do tend to gather at these corner points where they're going around or trying to avoid where land sticks out, and that's to be expected. Uh, that's where they were trying to get around when U-boats were sitting offshore. That's what they were trying to skirt when the uh, wind was blowing a certain way or the currents were going a certain way, and, and there was no uh, GPS where we knew exactly where we were. We were all doing this by either compass, in the old, old days, by compass heading and sextant, or in the only somewhat old days by Loran, and that wasn't always good either. <clears throat> so we have artificial reefs, um, and I don't know, you know, I don't know where the inspiration for artificial reefs came from, but uh, obviously the natural shipwrecks were there before artificial reefs, but they've really been a boon for fishing and diving uh, where they've been put down across North Carolina, and there's, there's a new one um, that was put down last year down off the Moorhead area, and there's a couple more in, in, uh, in the, uh, kind of in the planning stages. So it's, they're an interesting uh, place to dive, uh, particularly as they get some age on it and they get some growth. But the critical thing that made North Carolina diving what it is and what, what made it world renowned is World War II. Uh, Jim talked about it a lot uh, early this, uh, this morning, so I'm not gonna go over it in depth. But essentially, we had two types of U-boats um, that came to North Carolina, the Type 9 and then the Type 7 and its two variants, the C and the B. Um, this is what a typical size comparison, if you were to look at a 450-foot uh, tanker and a U-boat, a seven, Type 7 U-boat next to each other, the hunter and the hunted. As Jim talked about the early parts in 1942, this is when uh, the quote, happy time, Operation Drumbeat, which I think is the English translation. Somebody asked about the uh, German spelling. I don't worry about the German, I just call it Operation Drumbeat. But uh, when it hit North Carolina. And the number of victims killed. A lot of people are very surprised who either 
aren't longtime North Carolinians, uh, didn't grow up on the coast, don't know the history of how close and how violent it was off our coast during the earlier part of 1942. Uh, you read contemporary, contemporaneous accounts of explosions heard on the night out of Wrightsville Beach, Wilmington area, uh, and the wreck of the John D. Gill, one of the largest tankers that were sunk during World War II, burning for days on the horizon, the glow. And so, and then oil washing ashore and debris, things like that. Here's an example of what one of the problems was. We didn't do convoys, we didn't do air patrols, we didn't have destroyers, but we also weren't running lights out. So if your cities were lit up and your ship was running with lights, you kind of looked like at night that top frame to a sub, silhouetted nicely against the shore. If you turned your lights off but the cities were still lit, you looked like the second one. But if everybody turned everything off, you look like the third. So that was one of the factors that made us so vulnerable. We were a little slow to react and, and, and knocking, understanding what the threat was and how to help counteract it. The thing that makes uh, North Carolina unique, probably in the world, there are three U-boats with an e sport diving depths off North Carolina. And again, Jim, Jim is the expert on particularly the U-85, but there was the U-85, the U-352, which probably is the single most visited U-boat in the world. Uh, if you go to Olympus diving down in Moorhead and you don't go on the U-352, I have to ask what, what was wrong with the captain that day, because they usually go. Uh, it's in warm water, easy dive, uh, usually clear water, not much current, and it's, it's well, uh, sitting out of the sand. <clears throat> and then the 701, which has uh, been a more recent discovery, uh, quite a tale there. Um, and Dave Summers, I think he's in the audience, is one of the folks who assisted in finding uh, that originally. One thing about the wrecks, though, change is constant. Here's a shipwreck on the bottom of the ocean, a sailing ship. You'll see that in the uh, Great Lakes, or maybe real deep where there's no oxygen, you will not see that off the North Carolina coast diving. It'll look like this, at least a wooden ship to start with. It'll get there faster. The U-701, for example, as Jim was talking about, it was caught on the surface, hit by two aerial depth charges, went down, 15 approximately people came out of that conning ha tower hatch. They weren't recovered until a couple days later and there were five left. Um, that's probably close to what it looked like when it went down. But over time, the sands came up and, and it, from what I see the photos when Dave Summers and Uwe Lobos dove it, it looked more like that. So it, it's in a constant sand wave that covers and uncovers the wreck. And I don't know, I haven't been on it in a couple years, so I don't know where it's sitting now. It was really uncovered for a while, but then it got covered back up. So I don't know if anybody's been in it in the last year or two. Um, but uh, change, constant. The Dixie Arrow was hit by a torpedo right at the pilot house. Um, second one, a third one, Incredible bravery. Oscar Chapel was in the pilot house, saw there were people up on the stern, turned the, uh, the ship so that the wind was blowing the flames away from the, the, the bow, rather, the, there were pilot, uh, sailors up on the bow, blew it away from the bow onto him to save those folks. He died, was um, granted the Merchant Marine Distinguished Service Cross. I think he even had a uh, Liberty ship named after him. That's probably what it looked like when it went down. And from underwater, that's the scale. It's at 90 feet, and that's about what it looked like. Well, one thing we did uh, with the World War II wrecks, as, we, uh, as they went down, they were a hazard to navigation. Didn't want any other ships running into them. So what they did was they wire dragged them, 
And when they were done with that, it probably looked something like that. They usually drag them down to a mean depth of 40, 50 feet. Today, I don't know if you can see that red line. That's about the profile it takes now. So it's deteriorated even further. Change. The Aeolus. Um, funny thing about the Aeolus, when they, when, they, when they sunk the Aeolus, between that time and now is a longer time. Between that time and when I've been diving now is longer than when I started diving when the shipwrecks from World War II got sunk. So it's been down longer than the World War II wrecks were when I started diving. So that makes me feel old, but it kind of tells me a little bit about time. But even a ship was sunk intact on purpose, totally um, structurally sound, came in on its side, eventually settled into the sand, rusted, was there for probably a good five, six years, and then Hurricane Fran came along. It reached down at 110 feet, started rocking that boat, that ship, picked it up, twisted it, and broke it into three places, and now it's totally destroyed, but it makes it a very interesting wreck. But it's, so the, the storms are always changing what goes on on the wrecks of North Carolina. And this is a little cartoon I drew up, kind of the fish making an editorial comment, how interesting it is that uh, we humans, we build these ships, we purposely blow them up in war, and when they sink, we destroy them further so they don't hurt us. But as they stay down long enough, when we find they do other things, suddenly we want to protect them again. <laughs> so there, there's a, there's a, make them a sanctuary. So it's, it's an interesting circle of life kind of thing. Uh, but they are something to be protected um, in however you choose to do it. Uh, the marine life on them and the opportunity they give us to uh, be part of history and be part of the biology of North Carolina is priceless. So the evolution of a wreck, what survives? Generally what you're gonna find is the stern, the engine, the boilers, propeller, and rudder sections will survive first. They'll collapse last. Um, here's some examples of what those look like underwater. The second section, the stern and its machinery tends to uh, survive as well. And what happens is you have the ship and everything in the middle tends to be a hold that's either for fuel, oil, freight, whatever. Thin wall, relatively speaking, structurally built like a kind of your living room. And that tends to collapse as the, she the thin sheet metal or the thin metal on the sides rusts out and, and the wind and the waves buff it against it. You know, that kind of, they start rocking it. But the heavier stuff on the ends where the, everything comes together is generally tends to be a little stronger. Here's some examples of some uh, bow machinery and bow wrecks off North Carolina. <clears throat> and then the other stuff survives as well. That's uh, <laughs> anything hard and dense tends to survive longer. Uh, on the lower section, obviously that's a toilet. That was off the uh, uh, Aeolus, but um, the, uh, on the right is the deck gun of the World War II uh, destroyer uh, called the Schurz off uh, Moorhead City, Cape Lookout area. Here's what the wrecks look like underwater, and we haven't seen this today uh, that much, at least not in truck. We didn't truck we did, but uh, I wanted to give you guys a perspective of scale and also kind of what you're looking at underwater. Um, we'll just go through these quick. That's one of the U-Bets, the U-352 in the lower right. The stern end of the Kashina and the uh, up here, and the stern end of the uh, Hutton slash Papoose down below. That rudder has fallen uh, since that picture. I was there in June of, I think it's 2016 now, uh, and took a picture similar to that. Came back two weeks later after the hurricane had blown through, and that was down in the sand. So I have a kind of a matching picture that, again, change. <clears throat> a 
So when I, when I think about the marine life, again, this is probably not an official biologist's way of looking at it. I kind of tend to uh, um, break our, our marine life into zones, things that I see on the upper near the surface, things I see midwater, and things I see on the bottom. And it's a good way for me to know what to look for or where to look for it. In the, now, some of the mid-level stuff do, does come up top every once in a while and vice versa. But in general, it, it serves as a good construct for me. So the high water marine life tend to be the tuneral, the mackerel that are coming through or feeding, dolphin, barracuda, amberjack, pompano, manta rays, things like that. Um, The on the wreck marine life are literally right above the bottom to where the, the extent of the, uh, the, the wreck is tend to be the sharks, the spade fish, lionfish, uh, tropicals, turtles, grouper, snapper, things like that. And then on the bottom we have stingrays, anemones, uh, frogfish, octopus, etc. So, North Carolina dive, a typical dive. What do you see on every dive? And I, I've, I'm going to split this up into common stuff versus highlights. What's the difference? When you see highlights, everybody's talking about it on the boat, right? Even if it's somewhat common. But the common stuff, nobody ever talks about. <laughs> you don't say, hey, I saw a, you know, and we'll go through that. So amberjack, it's very rare for somebody to come up on the boat after dive and say, hey, did you see those amberjacks there? Uh, but, but the amberjack is one of the, uh, one of the uh, coolest fish down there. They tend to come in groups. They tend to follow you up and down the anchor line. They'll swirl around you, things like that. Um, there are several types in North Carolina, the greater amberjack and then the, what they call the almaco jack. The almaco jack is more of a football shape while the uh, greater amberjack is a little larger and longer. Um, but as you get them on the anchor line, you can watch every one of the little eyeballs are checking you out as you, as you make a pass. And the, here's, here's where they're gathering up. A couple, uh, um, they can be in schools of hundreds and thousands at times. Stingrays are another thing you see quite common off North Carolina, the southern stingray particularly, and they can get in, they can be three to four to five feet across in, in size, and there are lots of smaller ones too. They're often accompanied by, in this, in this case, cobia, uh, which trails them underneath and, uh, and uh, all around them, and it makes quite a, a seductive ballet that they do as they move in and out with each other. And then spadefish, another common uh, resident in schools of hundreds. They look like angelfish uh, with stripes. Barracuda. Uh, in the far uh, left corner over there, uh, right, your right, uh, there's barracuda that's, that's over the rudder of a um, schooner barge that they refer to as the box rack uh, for Cape Lookout. And that, the, that, that rudder is sitting off in the sand and it comes and goes with the sand levels and stuff. But uh, you can kind of see the outlines of it. And then this is a common sight off uh, North Carolina under the boat where the barracuda are hanging out. Bar Barracuda are very curious fish. It's not unusual. You'll be sitting there and all of a sudden you feel that there's something sitting right here. And it's usually, but they usually skirt away really fast. But I don't know if they're nearsighted or just curious or what, but uh, it's not unusual to be approached by them. And then uh, triggerfish are uh, quite common off North Carolina. This one is uh, building or protecting a nest on one of the wrecks. Jellyfish. Uh, there's thousands of jellyfish that float by, uh, but when you catch them, when they're being surrounded by little minnows like this, they're pretty, pretty interesting to watch. And can you see the flounder in, the, uh, in this picture? Um, 
So they're fun and sometimes hard to see until they move. Um, but uh, good eating. But uh, this one on uh, at the far side was a hoss. Um, and he was delicious. <laughs> With my knife, no less. Yeah. Oyster toadfish, another common resident. Uh, ugly as sin, it's like one of those faces a only a mother could love. You can hear them in the background. You know, uh, and you think it's, you think it's gonna be quiet underwater and it's not. There's a lot of crackling, but you can hear the and it's the, it's the oyster toadfish hiding there. But uh, they're an easy uh, photographer's subject. Don't move much, aren't, a, aren't afraid of much. And then the whole group of sea bass grouper snappers uh, are all over the place. Um, I don't, I, for some reason, I could not find a good picture of a grouper. And I think it's mostly because they, they are so smart, they stay away from divers. They know just the distance that a spear gun can shoot in order and keep that distance. And so with a wide angle lens on a camera, it's hopeless. And then you get these uh, tropicals. So one of the interesting things that most people don't expect off North Carolina, and this is because of the Gulf Stream, it's bringing up that warm water. And it's bringing with it a lot of tropicals. So fish you see in the Caribbean or down in Florida, you will see off North Carolina. Now, will they be like Penicamp Park or uh, the Caribbean Reef, Bloody Bay Wall? That kind, in the Caymans, no, but you, they will stand out because they're there, um, they're very colorful, and you go, oh my gosh, what are they doing here? But it's quite common off North Carolina to see samplings of tropicals within, uh, within a dive. Butterfly fish, angel fish, et cetera. French angel. And then we have the invader. So 2002, off Moorhead City, on the Atlantis IV, they reported, a diver came up and reported, there's a lionfish down there. And everyone went, what? And they took a picture of it, sent it to know, and sure enough, it was a lionfish. And that was the start, or the first identified, confirmed lionfish off North Carolina. And they're now all up and down the, uh, the North Carolina coast, all the way down to the Caribbean, to Cozumel, that whole area. And they come from the Pacific, that's what they're native to. Uh, how did they get here? A Little bit of a debate. They're a very popular aquarium fish. Um, there's theories that that's what was causing it. There's theories that the ballast from tankers that were in the Pacific cut loose eggs or some sort of larval stage, which kind of begs the question, why did this not happen before 2002, if that was the case? Uh, 2002 was about when Hurricane Andrew went through parts of Florida and wiped out some, apparently some large wholesale aquarium dealers, could be. But anyway, these things are very prolific. Uh, nothing wants to eat them on any kind of regular basis. But the only hope is they taste good and to humans, and so, um, we're hoping, uh, uh, Sean's here in the audience, I know he's led a couple of these trips, these uh, what they call uh, lionfish rodeos, essentially, where they go around and they spear lionfish and either sell them to the fish houses and stuff. They make, it's a great eating fish, but that's about the only thing that wipes it out. But you can get on a wreck and there'll be hundreds of them. They have a very vicious sting. Mark has experienced that firsthand. Um, they're very beautiful, but as you can see, how they blend in you know, to all the soft corals and surroundings here. Um, so they just sit there, they're an ambush predator, and they, they hit the small stuff, and so they think it's, it could have a really impact on um, juvenile grouper and, and things in their early stages of growth without any predators. They think cold water should keep them from spreading north, but life has a way, right? And then here's some of the highlight residents. Uh, frogfish, very hard to see, but very cool once you find them. Um, they just sit on the bottom and look like a lump of algae until you recognize what they are. Octopus, uh, another um, uh, highlight thing that are incredibly fun to play with and intelligent and 
they'll take whatever you offer them and try to grab it from you and, and snake that tentacle out. Turtles, um, everybody's talking when, the, when they run into a turtle, particularly a close encounter uh, off the coast. This guy here was two years ago. Um, I was down, it was early season wreck on the Shurs, dive on the Shurs, and I was trying to hood for the first time and I didn't like the way it fits. So I got to the end of the rack. So I got to change it. So I took my mask out, rearranged my hood and all this. And when I got everything cleared, sitting in front of me, not literally six feet away, was this loggerhead turtle. It was about this long. And he came right up to me and nuzzled and I stroked his head and went away and swam off. The funny thing about it was when I was messing with my uh, hood, I have, a, I have a, a still housing camera, and on it I have a GoPro mounted. And the GoPro was running, but when I was messing with my hood, I just let the cameras float there and hook to my uh, BC, and it was floating up. And later when I looked at the footage, I could see the turtle coming down, you know, doing a bomb on me and looking, because he was going, what the heck is going on here? But uh, it was a really, really cool encounter. Nurse sharks uh, and other non-sand tiger sharks are uh, also fun to see. Manta rays, uh, not real common, but everybody is high-fiving and giddy when you see them. And this is a, uh, this happened last year on, the, and then the total video, I had this, this manta for 10 minutes, but I'm not gonna show you the whole thing, but uh, this is on the Hutton actually now called the Ario. What's that? Well, I'll show you when I, I did a, uh, put together a couple clips of this and when he makes the turn, you're gonna see a sandbar shark that was a good seven-ish, eight feet um, come by him and so you'll, you'll get to see. He literally took me all the way down the wreck, and the Aria is probably a 400 foot wreck. Take, took me to the end, brought me all the way back, then took me in and followed the, somebody had put a wreck line down. He actually made a turn down the wreck line and dropped me off at the anchor line. And he literally waited for me a couple of times. Now watch here in the corner in the, um, the upper uh, left as uh, the shark comes around. caught it here. That shark is seven-ish plus feet. Okay, so um, it's, it was kind of a, I was literally sobbing underwater because this was such a thrill. For literally 10 minutes I was swimming with this, no one else around. And it's just, and had it all on video and stills. So it turned out pretty cool. but. The stars of the show for why people come to North Carolina now are the sharks, the sand tigers particularly. And the sand tigers, um, they're the sharks you tend to see in captivity because they take captivity well. They're very toothy. Um, in other parts of the world, they're called ragged tooth tigers, gray nurse sharks, things like that. Um, but they tend to collect on our wrecks, uh, the, Pap uh, the Dixie Arrow, the Proteus, the Tarpon, the Carib Sea, the Atlas, the Hutton, uh, they collect there in huge numbers. And uh, these aren't baited. You're not in a cage. You're not feeding them. You're not chumming them. You are in the middle of sharks on their own terms. And, and there's probably very few places in the world you can do that and get that close. And by close, I mean if you want to, literally where they're in, inside the focal length of my 180 degree fisheye lens. And I'm gonna give you an example of that a little bit, in a little bit. This is off the Carib Sea. And then what happens is this bait comes in and then the bait ball gets all around the sharks. And then as you see on the left-hand side of this picture, then the tuna and the jacks and the blue runners come in trying to get to the bait, the bait comes in and out uh, of the shark trying to protect, because fish in general, uh, and I think this is true for any game animal as well, they tend to like edges, 
And they can be physical edges, the side of a wreck, the edge of the woods. They can be temperature edges on a thermocline. You know, the, uh, the, the fishermen, the marlin fishermen talk about a, a temperature line that they, they fish. Uh, or it can be a visibility line or a current line, things like that. But they like edges. And I think what's happening with these small fish, they're just getting close to something big because they're too fast generally for, for the shark to bite, but it protects them from the, uh, from the jacks and stuff. Here's an example of one of the clouds of sharks. Okay, so here's an example of why there's a, Paul has a rule. I, I've made disagreement with the animals in general, particularly the sharks. I don't touch you, you don't touch me, right? I had friends who would always grab the tail of a shark or pop it, and the shark would swim away. And I don't want the shark to swim away. I want the shark to be in my face. That's, that's my happy place, you know? But this is why you don't mess with these guys. So um, I put a bottom cam out and it's a little GoPro that I put on a weight and leave on the bottom when between dives. And so he caught this thing. So he, you see him grab that. Okay, how fast he was. Now here's at a tenth speed. And so we have these little gnat minnows sitting in front of his nose, just irritating the heck out of him. Now watch this in tenth speed. You are not quicker than a shark, <laughs> I tell you. Okay? And as my wife says, well, what if they turn around and do that to you? And I said, well, I'm not going to give them a reason to, and that's worked so far. Um, but not only can they bite that fast, that shark, these sharks, and they're all seven to 10 feet uh, long, um, can turn inside themselves that quick too. I mean, they go from zero to serious really fast if they get spooked and they just snap their tail. And uh, it's really interesting. So this happened. On my Medicare day, I turned 65 on my birthday, August 4th, off of uh, the Proteus, off of Hatteras here. And you cannot ask, in my mind, for a better birthday present than this. This is last year. And they just came cruising through. The, the, they were going against the current, and I was coming with the current. So I, we were kind of doing this number. But there are literally hundreds of sand tigers here. And who knows how long it's strung out, right? You know, um, But that is a world-class National Geographic experience, right? People spend tens of thousands of dollars to travel the world. And this is wild. This is natural. There's no fake about this. They, they came there because they wanted to be there, not because I put bait out or anything like that. Uh, you can't ask for more wildness in nature than that. And that's, that's the thing about North Carolina diving, is it's not consistent. It drives you crazy sometimes, but boy, when it fires, it's, it's lifetime kind of stuff. So um, got a few minutes here. So let's see, this is, uh, I'm gonna give you a, uh, an experience of what it's like to be in the eye of the storm. So all these other fish are feeding and then the sharks are coming up, surrounded by the bait. Yes, he was that close. But see the dance that the schools do? Now, they're particularly a little bit more agitated than usual here, because they, they're in this kind of frenzy mode. Now watch this next guy, because I didn't notice this until after I looked at the film. I never saw this. Should we 
coming up here. Do you, I'm, you know, like I go, when I was at home scrubbing it through, I go, I didn't see that while I was done. <laughs> But that's kind of what it's like to be in the eye of a, a group of sharks that are kind of getting stirred up by the, the feeding and things like that. And then this is um, what it's like. So one of the things I love doing is to dive real quietly when the sharks are there and try to get up into their bubble. So I'm one of the sharks, you know, next to them, as close as I can be. I, you know, maybe I'm crazy, but to me, they, I'm just so happy and just, it's just, to me, it's just a giggly amount of fun and be in the middle of the, uh, of the bait ball. I've added some music here, try to ignore that. But, um, so you, you gotta be real quiet and slow. You get up with them and they know I'm there. I've never been hit by a shark, even accidentally, by a tail or anything. And they, they're literally in front of my mask One, two, three, four in the back. See, all these guys, this is a wide angle lens, so they're all within six feet, you know. The ones are even far away. Double checking. <laughs> and as much as I enjoy it, it's not to say I'm not a little bit nervous. I do want to know where they're coming from, but. Uh, Um, yeah, there's a couple places. I have a YouTube channel that all, a lot of my stuff's online. Yep. Mm -hmm. is this, like the GoPro or this is the GoPro here. Yep. And generally, what you'll hear if I had the natural soundtrack, you hear the bubble. Blah, 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 blah. Yep. Then you hear this, pow, 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 pow. and that's my still camera going off at full motor speed, you know, because I'm taking stills at the same time, you know. Um, it's funny, when I started photography, I had a housing and 36 roll film. Well, that was, when it happens, that's never enough, right? When you really need it. So I, I bought three more housings. And I used to go down with four housings. There were these little yellow things. I didn't shoot strobe. I, I, can't, I haven't comprehended or figured out how to shoot lighting. When you do see lighting here, it's video. Um, the, uh, so I would take four down. So that gave me four times 36. Woo, 144. Um, well, now with this single housing digital, I can take 2,000 frames and I can take four hours of video <laughs> in one dive. It's crazy. And then you throw in my GoPro cameras that I put on the bottom, and sometimes I'll put two of those down the bottom while I'm diving between dives, and they'll run for two and a half hours each. So I just, have, you know, you have this wealth of stuff. It's made a world, amazing amount of difference in underwater photography and and filming, but, um, and then here's a, a last one. This was off the Dixie Arrow, this was last year as well. And what it's like, sometimes these wrecks get so thick you can't even see the wreck because of the bait. And this is an example of what it was like, and here's, here's what's swimming all and out, in and around this bait. There's a stingray in there somewhere. See the the two uh, the albacore and stuff in the background. This guy was curious. And that, that's an interesting experience. I mean, both uh, from a dive point of view and as well as cosmically, for, for lack of a better word. Um, 
One of the best times I ever spent was on the Carib Sea, and it literally, I never saw farther than this from my, in front of my face because of the bait. But at six feet above me, above the engines, it was clear. And I kept going up and down, and, and then everything would come busting through feeding, and there'd be these uh, scales and pieces of fish come raining down, and, and you go, okay, I'm gonna tuck my fingers in. And, uh, but it was just, to have this mass of every fish just like right here, and uh, that's a little bit what this was like. Um, and yeah, here's, here's the feeders, the blue runners, and the, uh, the uh, amberjack. But um, as you hope you can tell, I enjoy, enjoy the heck out of this stuff. And to experience this, and if I can message that or get someone in, in this room or anywhere to appreciate what we have off North Carolina, you don't have to go to the Caribbean, you don't have to go to Cocos, you don't have to go to Indonesia, except to see the things that are special there. We have a lot of special things off North Carolina, and there is much part of our heritage as the result of this historic heritage of the shipwrecks in our coast. You know, I mean, that's why those things are there. And so, uh, I, I want to protect those as much as I protect the, uh, the wrecks as well, because you know, otherwise it's just truck lagoons. Sorry, Hal. <laughs> but you know, without the fish, you know, I'm not sure how much I would, uh, would dare. But that's it. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. And um, if you've got any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. <laughs> yes. Um, no, um, because you know, they tend to be in deeper water, you know, so they're in 90-ish you know, feet of water generally, uh, or deeper, uh, the shallowest ones. Um, so yeah, there, there's not a, a non-diver way to do it. Um, but in a way, that's the appeal. I mean, you got to make an effort. That's the thing about North Carolina. you got to want to do it. But when you want to do it, and you do it, you will get rewarded with world-class nat natural events that are, are pretty cool. You'll get frustrated sometimes because we go through blowouts and bad days and things like that, but uh, there's always something there to get your attention if you have your mind right, but then it turns out to these things that are just world-class and you go, oh my gosh, you know, so uh, anyway. The Bonner Bridge? Yeah, I don't, I've not kept as much track. Uh, I just went over the new bridge, the, the Bass Night Bridge, I guess, yes, um, for the first time last night. Uh, I like the view, I was real concerned. I love the Bonner Bridge. Now, I loved it from an architectural point of view. There was something about, you know, you turn in the Oregon Inlet Fishing Center there, um, and you get where they used to have the Dionysus propeller and you watch the sweep of that thing and rising up, to me it was gorgeous. And then once you were on the side of, other side of that bridge, you were in a whole different world, you know, on the island. That does that credit, you know, the new bridge does that and even goes higher. So it's a very architecturally, I really love the bridge. Um, yeah, so the, uh, it would be not unusual, you know, I don't know what their timeline is. They've, the old bridge in Moorhead City, they turned into artificial reefs and things like that. Um, so those end up being better for fishermen more than divers, because uh, as you saw in some of those uh, shipwreck, you know, the shipwreck diving scenes, the nooks and crannies are what, what gets all the fish life and stuff instead of big blocks of concrete. But uh, I do not know, maybe somebody else more local knows the uh, timeline for that. Uh, they are tearing it apart yet. Right, I knew that, and I knew they were gonna keep some of it as a fishing platform, yeah, yeah. But for the remainder, I, it would be a great idea to make it part of a structure or artificial reef. I, I think that's what they're doing. They're taking it offshore and dumping it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And there's an article I read this morning that said that they had taken components last reactor. Okay. Anything else? Thank you very much.